I just did a Twitter space with Benjamin Bowman. He's a fellow marketer, and he called me. He said, follow my favorite nine accounts to become the coolest solopreneur marketer in 2024, and he named me as the growth hacking dude. Asked me to do a Twitter space with him, and I'm like, yeah, because that sounds fun. So we did a Twitter space. This is the Twitter space. I exported it as an MP3. I put it into Descript. I did a little bit of editing to it, and I'm sharing it with you now, starting from when I'm in the zone talking about search engine optimization, but I talk about many of my favorite growth hacks on this Twitter space growth hacks, which if you're a frequent listener of the show, you know, and hopefully love. Let's jump into it. Ben, thank you again for inviting me onto the space. I did something this weekend, which got me really excited. This is something that all SEOs know to do, but very few actually think to do, which is to look for keywords that are within striking distance. So look for search terms that are within striking distance to see what you are already ranking for, but you're not optimized for it. And so I saw that my website, edwardsturm.com, is actually ranking on, like ranking above positions eight, eight, maybe let's say eight through like 30 for tons of very lucrative, valuable keywords that will make me money. And I just haven't optimized anything for these keywords. And I see that I am within striking distance for all these keywords and all I need to do is create pages for them, or in some cases, literally just use these terms in existing pages. And it's very minor changes that I have to make to rank for these lucrative, valuable keywords that will bring me money. And I'm very excited by that. Yeah, very cool. I think I recall talking to a gentleman about, you know, discovering these keywords. And one point that he made was a lot of the um, SEO, you know, keyword discovery apps they have show the show zero keyword search volume for some of these um is that what you see as well for the bottom funnel keywords or is there some other way that you discover them apart from google search console i look at what competitor well google search console is showing me what i'm within striking distance for it shows me what i can rank for really easily where i be, don't even have to think about it i just have to make the content if i'm trying to discover new bottom of funnel keywords new purchase intent keywords then I'll look at what competitors are ranking for. And then I'll take these terms that sound relevant. I'll put them into like a keyword suggestion, suggestion tool to see similar keywords. And then what I'll do is I'll actually look at the SERP, the search engine results page, and I'll see how competitive these keywords are. I'll see are a lot of other like high domain authority websites, authoritative websites, are they targeting these keywords? And a lot of the time, because these keywords are so low volume, they're not getting targeted. So they're just like wide open and they're so lucrative. And you see that. Now, sometimes they are. Sometimes they're getting targeted and sometimes they're getting targeted by high domain authority sites, very authoritative websites. And it would take a lot of resources to compete. And then I just don't do those and I find an alternative. And that's kind of how I do it. Got it. it. And there's so many of these keywords yeah. out there. Something that I believe, here's something that I believe that not many other people believe. And that's because nobody understands SEO. And even those who understand SEO don't understand bottom of funnel SEO. When you understand bottom of funnel SEO, you realize that every product and every service has a market. That's, what, that, that's something that I desperately believe is that every, there, every product and service has a market. And there's always people searching for your use cases. But most people don't know how to find those searches. Actually, now, now that I have so much success on TikTok, I believe that with TikTok as well, there's th something that I say is there's no such thing as a boring product or service. You just have to find the right spin for it. I made a video about Google Sur Search Console, which is considered to be like a pretty boring standard SEO tool. I made a video about it. It's again, considered to be boring. I phrased it in such a way where the video got 950,000 views because, and people were commenting, I don't even do SEO or know what SEO is, but I want to use this. Yeah, I think I saw that one. I think I commented like, what a killer. Hook. Yeah. Um, I can't remember. It was, it was exactly nobody, was nobody like, knows this about Google. Was it? I thought it was something like this, this technique is so good. Uh, it should be. Oh illegal yeah. That was the illegal like social media. That was for reusevideo.com. That video was for the content oh. automation tool. And that video, <laughs> that video has like seven or 8 million views across all platforms. Wow, yeah. that's interesting. 
Are you seeing similar success with the videos on, on Twitter um, versus the other platforms? Or is it just not as mature or doesn't operate the same way as say TikTok or Instagram? I think Twitter doesn't operate the same way because my videos do not go as viral. My videos barely perform on, on Twitter. In fact, the Twitter that I have now, you know, I started, like I have a, another Twitter account, a personal Twitter account, but I don't use it anymore. And I set that up in 2015. And I created this new Twitter show progress, which is what I'm calling into this from. I created this because when I started making these TikToks and, I, and I'm like, so what happened was I started making these TikToks. They were coming out every day. And I'm like, well, you know, like they're coming out on TikTok, but I, I, they should be coming out on every platform. Every platform uses mobile video. How can I do this? And I discovered reusevideo.com. And I, I, I literally just synced it up to every different platform that was available. And one of those was, was Twitter, but I didn't want my videos going to my existing Twitter with all of my friends because when I started on TikTok, my videos sucked. They were so bad. So, 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 so bad. And so I didn't want to like spam that account with all these bad videos as I was learning. So I started a new Twitter. And now this new Twitter, now I've gotten better at making videos and I've, I've just been bit, gotten better at making content. And now this new Twitter totally dwarfs the old Twitter. And so I just use this new Twitter. And, but yeah, all of the videos come out with that automation and they don't do as, they don't do as well. They don't do as well at all. It's kind of funny that you mentioned that, like um, the videos being cringe in the beginning and you not wanting to spam your friends. Uh, that's something I feel with, with Twitter, uh, with some of my Twitter posts, but it, it seems like that's just a journey everyone has to go Everybody. through. Uh, there's that cringe period first. Um, Looking back on it. I have now, a theory though. You know, think? my theory is that the videos are still cringe, but I just have so many followers that people are, people think they're not cringe. Like some of my videos really suck and I, I, I still have the bar like very low. My videos are definitely better overall, but some of my videos are like kind of dumb. And I, I think people will still look at them and just because like, oh, Edward has a hundred thousand followers at this point and he's gone viral so many times that this video is good. Yeah, I think that can make sense. Like, it's a little bit like those uh, platitudes that you see on Twitter that are like retweeted a hundred times. And you're like, man, anyone could have written this. It doesn't really mean anything, but because somebody, I suppose, famous did it, yeah, um, it gets a lot of exposure. Yeah. Uh, but rather than ragging on the Twitter creators, I'm curious to know, looking back on your TikTok video journey, was there anything that you noticed really pushed the lever? Uh, in terms of improving performance that you developed over time? Yeah, I made it. So when I hit my 365th consecutive day of posting, I made uh, my, my newsletter. I made a, actually it was like a 40 minute podcast. Everything I learned about TikTok up to this point and mobile video up to this point. And, and I turned that into a newsletter. And then I repurposed that newsletter into like a post on entrepreneur on the entrepreneur subreddit and on the TikTok subreddit. And so this post ended up getting 150,000 views on Reddit, which was just my newsletter, which I also turned into an article, which started as a podcast. And I think actually that even started as, as a TikTok. So the things that I, I, I learned like 20 or 25 things, but the four biggest ones, which is what I cover in this article, number one, I think was hooks. It was, it was just how important a hook is. And like, I didn't, when I started making videos, I didn't even think about the hook. I didn't think about the open, what I'm saying right at the beginning. It was just, let me share, let me make a video, let me get it out, let me get practice. And then my first video that I think did, oh no, no, it was, this wasn't, it, it was, it was a different video. It didn't do as well as my first viral video, but it did okay. And I just literally like read off a headline from TechCrunch about, I think it was, I can't remember this a famous founder and he started a, a trash company and a famous tech founder, he started a, a trash company for like a smart trash can. And TechCrunch said, this founder's new startup is trash. And so <laughs> I read, I, that was my, I just read that headline at the beginning of the video and the video got half a million views or something. And I said that to my friend and my friend said, the hook is great. And I'm like, oh, hooks. I never, and that was after posting for three months. 
And I'm like, oh, hooks. Oh, wow. I never stopped to think about those. And so then I started really deliberately thinking about hooks. And you can see a huge spike in my followers during this period when I was thinking just about hooks. And then I think the next one came when I started understanding how important trending topics were. And I started talking about like about trending topics. And then I made that's when I made the most viewed video in the world on the Silicon Valley bank collapse. And you can see another spike in my followers because I just start. You realize that if there's a trending topic that is like even somewhat, you can if you can relate it to your niche, and you just keep making videos about it, you're going to get followers and a lot of attention. It's so easy. So taking any trending topic and relating it to your need. Like when Sam Altman, the Sam Altman weekend, I just made video after video about Sam Altman being ousted from OpenAI. And all of those videos performed really well. It was so easy as making them so fast. So using trending topics, I was number two. And then number three, number four happened at the same time. And number three was I, I niched down my subject matter more and I put it, I made it more useful. I focused on making it actually more useful rather than just like new stuff. So I, I tried to put it in like some utility into all of my content. And then the other big thing is I started using an AI editing tool called Descript, which is one of the most incredible. I, I mean, I started as a video editor. Like I said, I was a viral, viral video producer on YouTube. Descript transcribes all of my videos and podcasts, it can do green screen with one click. The, trans the transcription is automatic and then you edit in the transcript and not in the timeline. And you can remove all the gaps between words with one click as well. So any gap between, like any pause between a sentence or, be or between words that for me, I have it set to that's over one fourth of a second, I just minimize that to one fourth of a second or in my videos, there's no, there's no gaps at all. So it's just jump cut, jump cut, jump cut, jump cut. And I do that with, with one click. And that allowed me to turn out content that was just a lot higher in quality, a lot higher quality. And lots, lots to get into. So you mentioned the hooks. <laughs> so you mentioned the hooks. Um, this is something I've been looking at a lot recently. I, I sort of didn't pay much attention to it either uh, until you had to. But um, how, how do you research them? Or are you honestly just coming up with a lot of them off the top of your head? Yeah, I come, I come, uh, I, I come up with them off, off the top of my head, actually. And, and then sometimes I will hear a hook that I think is very good. And I'll just, then I'll, I'll use it. Also, I'm very shameless about taking content that I heard somewhere else that performed well and then sharing it on TikTok. I'm very shameless. I don't care. Like... When um, I, I, I don't think I'll, I'll name these projects, but I've named them before. So me and my friends, we invented play to earn. We made the first play to earn game in crypto and we made a decent amount of money from that. And for a while I was getting recognized in crypto from this, but the game should have been a lot bigger than it was. And actually what ended up being the biggest crypto game by market cap, I just don't want to name them, but they were the biggest crypto game by market cap. Everybody knows this game. They launched two months after us and just stole a lot of elements from our landing page. And they didn't do as well because they come out into a more saturated market, but they stuck with it and they did do well. And the money that they made just kept them through crypto winter. And then when the bull run started in 2020 and 2021, they became the biggest game. There was another game. Oh, so crazy. They just literally ripped off everything they took our entire landing page all of our copy all of our art and they they just changed the assets the in-game assets their game sold i think um maybe a half a mil or a million on their first on their first week but then they used this and, and it was and they rug pulled it was a bad game but they used this to raise two million dollars from coinbase ventures and then they launched another game which became really popular and they gave everyone who they rug pulled assets in that new game. And, and, and they started literally by just taking all of our art and our copy. And I learned that 
like everyone just takes good content. And so, right. yeah. So like, if I hear a good hook, I'll use it. If I like, so something that I did this weekend, oh my gosh, I, I read Sean Purry's newsletter. Sean Purry is a host of my first million and he has this newsletter that goes out every, every week. Sometimes he misses a week, but it's called like the best tweets that he finds. And he shared the, his, his newsletter a few weeks ago was really good. He shared really entertaining tweets and I just read them. I made two TikTok videos for each one of these entertaining tweets. And I just read them on my TikTok. One of those videos is up to 600,000 views. No, like 700, 750,000 views. And then the other is up to 200,000 views. I just read the tweets. Wow. Yeah. So if, if I find good content that's in my niche, I'll use it. And if I find a good hook that's in my niche, I'll use it. And then when I don't have anything, I'll think of a hook myself. And there are some like some pretty good hooks that people can use. Like nobody knows this about X or people don't realize this about so-and-so or you'll ne you, right. my friend never would have thought to have done this or this person never would have thought to have done this. Yeah. Right. Or this person is making, this person is making X amount of money doing this. Yeah, I think I've, I've seen quite a few of these. Uh, now that you mentioned them, they ring a lot of bells, uh, which is quite cool. You also mentioned uh, trend jacking. Is there a particular way that you stay on top of trends to, to work out what to post about? Um, I, I actually know. I keep thinking that I've discovered the next subject matter hack and the next like trend hack. And it's it, like then the hack turns out to not work as well as I thought. The, for me, the best way that I get trends is uh, I have, you know, a, a big, pretty big network, uh, especially like a network of people in my industry. And these people will just share stuff with me. And if it's good enough for them to share with me, it's usually entertaining enough for me to make a video on and for me to make content okay. about. And then there's some, there's other times where it's just so obvious. I, I made a tick within two hours of Sam Altman being ousted from open AI with that, that hitting like the news. I just was like, this is huge. I didn't need anybody to tell me this was huge. I'm just like, this is huge. And I made a video about it. And then I made another video about it, another video within the Silicon Valley bank collapse. I, I didn't realize how big it was, it was until my friends explained it to me. And I have several friends who had their, their startups funding in Silicon Valley bank. And, Ooh. and when like they explained it to me, and then I was seeing it all over Twitter. And so then I just realized, okay, I have to make content about this. So sometimes you know, how and then other times you just see. Yeah, and it's a bit difficult for me sometimes because I, I try to actively avoid the news. I know the great irony of being on Twitter and trying to avoid the news, but I tend to hear about all these things. I hate and, the news. It's um, garbage. Unfortunately. I think the news, I think the news is garbage. I, I actually avoid the news as well. I'm like you. I'm, I'm just lucky in that I have a lot of friends who like to share stuff with me. And so when something is a really yeah. big deal, they'll, they'll share it with me. But generally, I don't read the news. I don't know what's going on in the world. Fair. Yeah. It's a, it's a good filter to use your friends. Uh, unfortunate for them, though. Do you, do you have any, uh, do you have any growth hacks? Do you have any, anything that's made like an outsized impact in your life? Hmm. Good question. None that really comes to mind at the moment. Um, perhaps I should have prepared some before this particular Twitter space, but I was looking more to get into your mind, particularly on um, on ads, actually, um, because you you were one of the first people that I saw talking about the uh, the Twitter. I discovered launch. it. That was that was on me. Yes, right. And I credited you with it uh, on my Thank tweet. You. How did you actually discover it in the first place? Were you just mucking around and noticing that the first four days were um, the cheapest, or what? How did that happen? It's so. One year ago, I was living in Warsaw, and. And Elon Musk had just taken over Twitter and all the advertisers were getting pissed and they were leaving. And I, I recorded this voice message. I was walking through the snow in Warsaw. It was such a cold winter. And I recorded this voice message to a friend of mine who's a media buyer. And I said to him, I said, I think Twitter is going to become the best place to buy media because all the advertisers are leaving. And Elon Musk has, gone, has done multiple spaces on how he wants to improve the ad platform. And so I thought... I, I just thought that that's going to be a place to pay attention to. And it worked out a bit different, but it did work out. So I, I started running campaigns in 
February or March of 2023. And they were doing okay, but they weren't like, they weren't crazy, but they were definitely doing okay. And then it was, you know, it was, um, I got so lucky. People won't, will, probably won't believe how lucky I got, but I just, I, it was one afternoon in September or August. Must have been, maybe it was August. And I was back in New York City where I'm from and I started a new campaign. Oh, I think I had tried a different, I, I had tried, I, I hadn't run campaigns on, on Twitter for, for maybe two months or three months. And I heard someone say, try simple ads. So then I tried simple ads. And what I do when I start any campaign is I just do it as a, at a dollar a day. That's what happens, yeah. Because I'm, I'm kind of just learning, I'm, I'm kind of seeing like how, how it's gonna work. And so it was like my first campaign using simple ads and I, I clicked, they didn't, I would have run follower ads, but Twitter took that away, the ability to run ads to get followers for your profile. And the new Twitter removed that. So you couldn't run ads just advertising your profile. So I picked ads advertising my website because that was the second most appealing option to me, even though they have four types of ads. So I picked the website ads. And then I, I guess I said it, I just turned up all targeting because I'm like, I just want to see what's going to happen. And, and I put the rest of the settings in. And then I also was curious about what optimized targeting would do. Because I, I guess I had this theory. I'd been listening to Elon Musk talk on Twitter spaces about how he wanted to improve, to improve stuff. And optimized targeting just going to use their algorithms to find the most relevant viewers of the ad. So yeah, I'm going to turn that on. And, you know, my theory was that Elon was going to improve the platform to such an extent that it's just, it, it's like going to be that good. But I think this is a glitch where the ads platform is like, not working as it should, because you should not be getting. So what happened was, then I went for a, I didn't, I, I set it up, set it to run at a dollar a day, and then I went for a bike ride. And I biked around Prospect Park in Brooklyn. Such a good bike ride, it was a beautiful day. I remember I was listening to an episode of My First Million. And then I, I, I'm coming home, I'm walking home, and I check my email, and I see that I have all these new signups to my newsletter, because I was, the ad was running to my newsletter. And I'm, and I'm thinking like, what the, what, what is happening? And then I, I run home and I go to ads.twitter.com and I open the dashboard and I, I see that, <laughs> that I, I see that like in the time that I've been gone for the several hours that I've been biking, my ad has shown to 200, 300,000 people and I've spent 10 cents or something. And I'm like, what the, what is happening? And then I'm like, can I do this again? So then I try it again and it happens again. And then literally that same day with my fat mouth, I make a TikTok about it. And that TikTok <laughs> gets 800,000 views. And, and what I do is, I, I is at the end of the TikTok, I'm like, if you want to hear how I do this, I'm going to record a podcast about it. You can hear it at edwardspod.com. I have this really unique thing that I do where I buy domains that are memorable and then redirect them, 301 redirect them to the longer URLs. So edwardspod.com <laughs> goes to edwardsturm.com forward slash the dash edward dash show. Edwardslink.com goes to edwardsturm.com forward slash newsletter. But I don't have to say edwardsturm.com forward slash newsletter, I can say edwardslink.com. And for my podcast, edwardspod.com. And it's memorable and it's easy to type into a browser. And so anyway, all these people went to that and then that popped off my podcast and because I, because I just started sharing it. And then I found that it was just such making content about the Twitter X ads glitch as I called it was such easy views. And so I was doing that and wow, uh, I, I def, I blew up the glitch, but it still works. I'm still getting 300,000 impressions for a dollar a day ad spend. It's not mil it's not millions like it was before at the, at the height. I was literally getting 2 million impressions a day. No, 2.5 million impressions a day for a dollar. Like, yeah, un unreal. I don't think I'll, we'll ever be back there. Yeah. Oh, you, to some degree, you have spoiled it in that uh, I see a lot of people jumping on it now. And I've seen it a lot more on YouTube. Really? Um, 
you type things related to Twitter, Twitter ads. But uh, I followed it once. I probably discovered it from you. Must have been like a month after you had written about it. I thought it was, I thought it was pretty cool. And I tried it and I found the same. Like I was getting clicks for 0 0.003 cents, euro cents. So not even a single euro cents, which was pretty cool. But I, I found that a lot of the traffic, a lot of the engagement, all that kind of stuff was just primarily, you know, really low quality um, and basically bots. Well, what was your experience on that? Did you get a lot of, you know, bots interacting or was it the idea is you're using their creative to properly target or what, what are your thoughts? I don't think it's, I don't think there were bots because these were people who were actually engaging with me. So I have an opt-in flow for my newsletter. And these people were responding to my opt-in flow and then I would respond to them and they would respond back or people, these people would follow me. They would see the ad and they would follow me and I would DM them. I would literally say, are you real? And they would respond and it wouldn't be like how chat GPT would respond. It would be like how a low GDP per capita, non English native would respond. And so the caveat with this is that most of these people are they, they speak poor English and they're low GDP per capita. However, you still target because you're targeting so many people, these people are reposting, they're resharing and the ads reach better people that way. Or you get lucky and you just hit also a bunch of people who they might be living in low GDP per capita places, but they are, they don't think like low GDP per capita people and they don't have the interests of low GDP per capita people. And so some of the people were truly relevant and are, are like fervent consumers of my content or have converted. And then most of them were just garbage. I wouldn't, they're not, they're not bots though. They are real people. They're just poor people who don't speak English very well and who don't share the same mindset that you and I might share. Right. Yeah. That, that's super interesting. Cause I, I would have assumed, so it sounds like what you're saying is people from, I suppose, non-target countries. Well, you, well, you don't, set, you don't, the, the thing is you don't set a target country. You turn off, you right. turn off location and then you put on optimized targeting. So I mean, in terms of, uh, ultimately these are not necessarily the subscribers that you want to get or the consumers you want to attract, but they act as a, some of them, some of them might be, relevant. some of them might be because some of them like lot, like I, I was the number one podcast because I, because I was running these ads to my podcast. I was the number one podcast in Latvia and in, in the number one marketing podcast in Latvia and in Mexico and, and in Ghana and a few other places. And I know people in Ghana and I, there are some really smart people in Ghana and there are some really smart people in Latvia. And I, I don't have to tell you, there's some very smart people in Mexico, but you know, they're not, most of them aren't like New York city quality people. But in general, like the, the, the people in these countries aren't New York City quality people. But for me, it's like still okay because I'm able to target these people. It's, you're still getting a deal on these high quality people. It's kind of what I'm saying. And a lot of people will repost it anyway. Yeah, that sounds pretty fair. Are there any other interesting hacks that you've been trying with, with ads in general, not necessarily Twitter? Um, although it seems like Twitter has the most potential, though I've just not seen anybody really crack it yet. Um, I can't, there's actually something that I'm doing right now that I can't, I, I'll, I'm going to talk about it in a year from now. And it's like one of the greatest heists that I've done. It's so funny, but I can't, I can't, I can't share it. I can't share it publicly at least, but it uses, it uses Twitter X ads. So what could I share? What, I don't, I don't, what could I share with ads? I can't really, I don't think I can share anything else. With, I mean, I, yeah. Like the obvious stuff is I, is I'm running ads to a lot of my own content and, and I really like that. I like running ads to the podcast. In fact, I, I, I talked about this on my podcast yesterday, how I just noticed such a huge bump in listeners from running these ads to my podcast. These people are listening. They are actually listening too. And then some of them stick. And that's the thing yeah. that I really like doing. And that, like I said, that got me listed. So, okay, here's something that I did. I can, I guess this was several months ago. <laughs> this is the thing that I did. Yeah. So I ran these ads to my podcast and then my podcast already had listeners because I was promoting it on TikTok. But these, you know, at the time I was getting two and a half million impressions for a dollar a day. And 
I was getting just so many listens that, like I said, I ranked number one for marketing in all of these low GDP per capita country, countries. And then some, some podcast ranking service that tracks the performance of podcasts emailed me randomly and it's like, hey, Edward, your podcast is ranking number one in all of these countries. I didn't know that until it emailed me. So then I screenshotted that and I, I put it all over LinkedIn and all over Instagram. And I'm like, look how good at marketing I am. And, and I mean, like that was, you know, that was to me, that was like something funny where I leveraged this one thing and turned it into this other thing and turned it into this other thing. And then, then that caused people to listen to the podcast because they're like, oh, Edward's podcast must be good. It's ranking number one in all these countries. I like that idea. Yeah. I want to, you're, you're taking credibility. One of the things uh, that I think from one area and shifting to the next. That, one of the things that I think that no one understands, that very few people really understand in marketing is leveraging credibility, like you said. People don't know how to do that properly, and a lot of people don't think to do that. And when you have one win, you should leverage it into another win, which will and into a bigger win and a bigger win and a bigger win. And that's something that I think SEO has taught me. Because you understand how valuable high authority backlinks are and you think of every trick in the book to get them. And one of those things is just like, if you're reaching out to people, you're like, yes, I've appeared in these publications, so I am noteworthy and credible. And that makes you more likely to get your link. Yeah, very cool. For people who want to connect with you and learn more, um, where should they go and what should they look at? You can go to edwardspod.com, edwardspod.com. And that's my podcast, my daily podcast. Edwardslink.com is my weekly newsletter. And on TikTok, I am build in public. Let me tell you something funny. Before I was on TikTok, I was trying to do the build in public movement on Twitter. And I figured out what it takes to do build in public on Twitter. It takes two and a half to three hours a day of, of just like really like tweeting and responding to people. Sometimes four hours a day. And you got you to gotta follow people back at the beginning. And you, you, need, you really need to get as many followers as you can because those followers are going to act as a megaphone for you. And it was requiring so much work. And I, I'm like, maybe build, the build in public movement, my theory was that maybe the build in public movement isn't as saturated on TikTok because it was very saturated on Twitter. And so I called my... I couldn't, I couldn't crack build in public on Twitter. It was taking too much time and it was so frustrating. And so as a, as a, basically an F you to the, to the people who are not following me back, you know, this was, I think a year and a half ago as an F you to these people who weren't taking me seriously as a build in public person on Twitter, I called my TikTok build in public because I thought it would be cool to rank number one for build in public. And for the first like several months, when you search build in public on TikTok, I did not show up. But now if you search build in public on TikTok, I show up number one because I am the top build in public person on TikTok. Nice. And in fact, I'm also making it so when you search build in public, I'll be on the first page of Google now. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So F these people who didn't, who didn't believe in me. <laughs> who didn't take me seriously. That's hilarious. Are you going to build another account called Middle Finger or something like that? Uh, any any keyword anything that but, I want to target. Very cool. Cool. Um, appreciate your time. And I'll put those links to your show um, in the comments. Uh, there's no like, there's no podcast comments on this. So you're going to have to add another tweet. But in any case, really appreciate your time. And uh, yeah, I hope you have a good rest of the yeah, morning. Amazing. I'm probably going to take this. You know, I might actually take this Twitter space. And then what you can do is you can save a Twitter space as an MP3. And then I'm going to probably put it into Descript and run it through Studio Sound on Descript. It's just this one click check checkbox that uses AI to make the audio sound so much more professional. And then I might just use this as my podcast for today. Nice. Yeah. That's it's a really get your two for one. Content repurposing. That's the hack that a lot of people, they just don't know how to do properly. For sure. Maybe we have to have another space about that in particular. Uh, that would be really I could cool. talk about that one all day long. That'd be great. Cool. In any case, appreciate it. Thank you, everybody, for joining. And uh, yeah, have a good rest of the day. Bye now.